Hello and welcome again to AFC Wimbledon TV. My name is Ian McNay and today our guest is Terry Burton. Hi Terry. Ian. And of course Terry was involved with Wimbledon FC for around 14 years. He started off um, looking after the reserves, became assistant manager to Joe Kinnear through a very successful period, went on to look after the youth system for two or three years and then of course came back to manage the first team when we were at the bottom of the Premier League and managed us for uh, two seasons and three days I think it, I think it was. He was also uh, very supportive in the early days of AFC Wimbledon and came to the trials on Wimbledon Common and helped out Terry Innes with some advice and I've seen him down at the club several times since then. So Terry, let's start with your um, career at Arsenal because you were actually captain of the uh, Arsenal youth team that won the FA Youth Cup in 1971. Uh, yes, a long time ago now. Um, I'd been at Arsenal as a schoolboy from uh, about 1964, um, 65, uh, about that year. Billy Wright, actually, who was then manager, I played in front of, uh, in those days, Islington Schoolboys, who I played for. We, we played a game in front of, uh, before the Arsenal and Man United game. And we wore red, so the, the um, both sets of supporters <laughs> were cheering for us. Fantastic. And uh, I actually scored a goal. Um, and it was, it was amazing those days. We, we, we didn't finish the game until about quarter to three, which would never happen, obviously, nowadays. But um, so that we came off the pitch about quarter to three, the stadium was full, and uh, I just scored quite close to the end. And, and Billy Wright picked, I think it was three of us from that team, who were sort of 11, 12, to go and train at Arsenal, and I was one of those. So uh, I, I was there from the age of, of that sort of age, and then c came in as, a, as an apprentice footballer, as they were there then had a year as a pro and, and played in that FA Youth Cup final, um, which was a two-legged affair. We drew nil-nil at Highbury. And then we went to Cardiff and uh, Ninian Park and I scored the second goal in a, in a two-nil win, which won us the FA Youth Cup. Yeah. And that was a year that Arsenal won the double? They, won, they did, yeah. They, they won the double. We won the South East Counties League, the League Cup and the, and the FA Youth Cup, I think, as a youth team. And I think we might have finished runners up in the football combination so the whole club was was buzzing really um, yeah great memories and probably the, the the best memory of that is traveling with the first team on top of the open-air bus through the streets of, of Islington with thousands and thousands hundreds of thousands of, of people it seemed anyway um, lying in the streets and you know we were there with the the you know Charlie George's who was a mate of mine and and George Graham's and uh, that that type of player at the top of the bus celebrating the uh, yeah, performances throughout the season. You must have felt at that time you would go on to be a top professional footballer, did you? Well, you, you, you know, like all footballers, you, you, if you, and, and again, those days the squads weren't as big. I played, I played in the reserves. I was a regular in the reserves, um, uh, reasonably regular in the reserves. But had only ever made uh, travelled as sort of fourteenth man as with, there was a, like they had one substitute in those days and yeah. I travelled to West Ham on the team bus but never you know never looked like getting close to it and really and truly you needed <coughs> excuse me you needed to have been close to it you thought to have got in there but you, you still think that there's a you know a career in in the game for you um, and. I went away at the end of that season with the Arsenal on the youth team tour to Portugal and we, we played Benfica, Inter Milan and I scored two goals, one against Inter Milan, one against Benfica. I was playing midfield at that time and, and um, I'd only just changed into midfield in the last year of my, I previously played more as a defender. Um, but as always, there's always hope and you, you, you hope that something might, you might get uh, another year professional. But when I came back off the tour, I went to see Bertie Mee and they, uh, they, they said that unfortunately they were going to release me. Um, mm. And as you can imagine, I'd been there for probably six or seven years at that time, one way or another as a schoolboy and then as a full time. The disappointment, my father was running a, a, a pub. Um, I really didn't want anything to do with football. I was Arsenal were my club and I'd, I'd supported them as a, as a kid. And it was, um, 
it was the disappointment of it that I, I stopped playing for some time. Did you feel let down by us and as such? Or did Not you really, um, yeah. but probably, I don't know, like, you know, probably a lot of players when, when things don't quite go for you, you know, you, you, you think it's somebody else, but it was, it was the fact of it, you know, I'd, I'd uh, you know, in hindsight, who knows, maybe I could have got in. I, I had the opportunity to go to Peterborough. Um, Peterborough wanted to sign me and I didn't drive. I was sort of 19, 18, 19. I hadn't passed my driving test. I was going to travel up with a guy called Dave Mechik who played for Arsenal Reserves. I was also going to sign for them. Um, and then they said, no, because of your age, we want you to come and live here. And I just got engaged. Um, and it was, I thought, well, no, Peterborough seemed the, you know, miles away, it seemed the other side of the world. So it was one of those that I thought, no, I, I, there's no way that um, I'm going to do that. If I can live here and travel up, which this other guy was going to do, then I'll, um, I'll sign for you. Uh, and it was in the local Peterborough paper, Arsenal Starlet signs for Posh and things like that. But, so there was that, but in the end, I drifted out of the game for several months after that. But you came back in and you went to Folkestone, didn't you? I did. I played non-league at Folkestone. Um, which again, with hindsight, would have been easier to have got the Peterborough. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. but my family yeah. at that stage had then moved to um, Abbey Wood in South London, so it was in Kent. It was that that end, and um, we'd. Uh, I played there for a little while. Um, took my coaching, my prelim coaching award in in London with a, a guy called Roger Thompson, who was um, who was the coach taking the course. That was a smart move at your age, doing that coaching course, wasn't well, it? It was, and I very nearly never went in. I remember it was a place called Moberly Youth Centre in Kilburn, and I was going to go in, and I've gone into the car park, and again, I saw this, this flash sports car, and this guy, tanned, jumps out the sports car and all that, and I thought, oh, Christ, can I really be bothered? And I nearly turned around and, and walked away, but the, for some reason, I, I carried on, and the, the flash guy was a guy called Roger Thompson, who turned out to be a good friend of mine and manager of mine and he took me to Epping with him from after that right. I was on the coaching course and I was playing during the coaching courses and he said I'll come down to Epping where I had a couple of really good seasons loved it really sort of I got my appetite back for playing um, won the player of the year down there really enjoyed it a great set of players and staff and Roger then went to Hayes in the Ishmian League and I followed him to Hayes, played there, um, and it was at that time that I'd really sort of started coaching. Was Terry Brown at the Hayes at that time? <sighs> I don't think so. No, because he was no. at Hayes. No, okay. Yeah, there was a guy called Bob Gibbs who was the, he, Roger Thompson was the manager. Roger left yeah. very soon after we went there, within about three months. He, he left to go to Arsenal as, as yeah. reserve team manager. But I stayed on and there was a guy called Bob Gibbs who came in as a school teacher, but very successful at non-league level as a manager. Then Alan Harris. No, he would have been, been, been a player at that time. It doesn't matter anyway. Yeah, yeah. Bob, I can't remember yeah. if Terry was yeah. there. He probably, probably wasn't in the side anyway if yeah. he was at that stage. He was probably... Then you went to Lingate, uh, Leighton Wingate. Yeah, Leighton Wingate and a, a, a time at um, uh, Ilford. Ilford okay. was, I went okay. to Ilford in between okay. that. Where's a guy called Mickey Doolin who was manager. Um, and a really a former Tottenham player, really nice guy, got on really well with him. And I was, Mickey um, was the manager there. And Ilford, it seems to have followed me around a little bit, Ilford uh, folded as a club, but amalgamated with uh, Leightonstone. So they became Leightonstone and Ilford, who right. nowadays are Dagnum Redbridge. Uh -huh. It's that, from that, uh, okay. uh, that's where the birth of that sort of started. Uh, but Mickey went to Leighton Wingate and said, well, come here, you can come as player coach. So, so I had a, a while I was, I'd had my prelim badge and I was working at the Arsenal on a part-time basis doing the coaching, but also playing at the same time and doing some coaching at non-league level. So in effect, you got into coaching quite young, didn't you, for yeah, the time? Yeah, I was, that was probably, I was probably 22, yeah, 23. Very then. young. Yeah. yeah. So did you kind of have the back of your mind that, Okay, the playing side may never work out long term, but the coaching side might well be my thing. Not or... really. I, I, you know, Bertie Mee said to me when I eventually went back to the Arsenal, and it was Bertie Mee who took me back in um, coaching at part time level. You know, you've probably always been a coach because as a young player, I was very vocal on the pitch. I was always pulling and 
pushing people around and things that probably coaches do. So he, he said that to me. He said, well, you've always played like a coach. And I had no idea where it would take me. I just, I enjoyed, eventually enjoyed doing it. Um, and it was a natural process for me to, um, to be organising people on the football pitch. OK, so you then went back to work for Arsenal. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was while I was, I was still playing and I went part time and we did what was called evening training. And again, that I'd, uh, I'd started working in the schools. Right. Uh, because again, I, I had a period where I, I, my father had a public house. He'd, he'd lost the public house, left it, and he, by trade, was a stone cleaner. And I worked with, with him for about 18 months. And um, it was hard work. You know, it really was hard work. And I, I can still remember that it, it was a, my, my wife then was pregnant and I was in a, a cradle above Russell Square in London on a really sort of windy November type day and 150 feet up in, the, in this cradle and climbing out of the cradle and the wind taking oh. the cradle away from underneath me sort of thing and I was holding onto the bars and climbed out and it just dawned on me then that I've got to do something else with my life you know and uh, I'd had my prelim coaching badge um, and I went to work in schools I, I phoned up an ex-school teacher friend of mine who was who'd been a teacher when I was at school and I got into Holloway school was which is where I went as a kid I went there as a, as a games teacher as a, as a football instructor and, and uh, from that I, I got another school in the mornings, so I then became a full-time games instructor. I had my coaching badge, uh, went to watch Arsenal one August day, the kids training, I'd phoned up and they said, yeah, come along. For some reason, somebody hadn't turned up to do the coaching. Bertie, me and uh, Gordon Clark, who was the chief scout, said, would you take them for us? I just got in my jeans and a T-shirt and I took that coaching session for them that day. And they said, look, in September, will you come back and take the evening training for us? So yeah. it's it's um, it, it's I've been very lucky in that respect. Things, things were have... starting to work out, weren't they? Yes. They really were. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then you you got the official position as as I did. Yeah. Uh, funny in that fir very first year, Bertie Me, who was the manager, said, "Look, at at, um, at the end of the year, we're going to make some changes. Um, we want you to become youth team coach." I was only I was just about 24, literally, I was coming yeah. up to my 24th birthday. And uh, I thought, great, terrific. And Bertie Me then got the sack in the, November, in the, in the February of that year. And um, Terry Neal came in as manager. Uh, I didn't get, they didn't make the changes because they didn't know the setup. But I, it, they did make the changes the following year. And so that's when I went in as a full time youth team coach when yeah. I was 25. Yeah. yeah. And you, one of the players you brought through was Tony Adams, I gather. Tony was one of the, the yeah, one of a group of, you know, a lot of players at that time who, 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 who came through. But Tony, uh, you know, does kind of warrant me with, with, you know, some of the early, uh, you know, uh, an influence on him in the early days. Um, how, how does training compare to training now in terms of sophistication and work rates and things? I, I, I you know, I, I would think that. It's improved a, a lot, but it's been a lot different. But yeah, but again, it was still about taking players as individuals and trying to make them better. Yeah. And I think someone like Tony Adams, for instance, who was a defender, I actually used to take him and do defending work with him. So you were still, it's still the basic principles are still the same. You've you've got a player, you've got whatever position he plays, you've got to try and make him better. Uh, in those days, it was more about the individual for myself as a young coach and working with those and trying to improve them rather than the team. Uh, uh, so I suppose the principles are still the same, really. Mm. So Don Howe then became the first team manager at Arsenal. Yeah. And then you were made the Arsenal coach. Yeah, again, the progression went along quite nicely. I had two or three years as reserve team manager, as, as youth coach, went into the reserves, which I did at about 18 months. And uh, again, Terry Neal left got the sack, Don got the job, and I moved up with Don to uh, work with the first thing. Mm. That must have been quite something. It, it was fantastic, because I was the only one in the change room who, who I didn't know. Uh, <laughs> all the others, you know, the, the, the um, 
Pat Jennings and Viv Anderson and Tony Woodcock and Charlie Nicholas and Graham Ricks and Kenny Sansom and you know endless lists of sort of full full internationals. So yeah, yeah but it, it I don't know it, it it was fantastic grounding for me. I was fortunate to work with someone like Don Howe. I um, was only his balls and bibs man really, but it was a great opportunity for me to learn from somebody of that quality. And then George Graham became manager. Yeah, Don got the sack. Uh, I'd left, actually, I had 18 months with Don, and Don had been my mentor and everything, and probably we were so much alike. Don needed a change. He brought in a guy called John Cartwright, very good coach. Um, but I went back to the reserves. But that year, uh, they didn't do very well, and they got the sack. Um, George then became manager. I was reserve team manager for a year uh, and we we didn't get on particularly well it, it, was, it was more my fault really I've, I've been at Arsenal again for a long time then um, all the young players used to probably come to me and talk to me if they weren't in the team and this that and the other you know the the Stuart Robsons and the Colin Hills and the Mickey Thomases and the Paul Davises um, Martin Hayes and Merson and David Rowcastle and people like that, you know, they'd all come through during a period, Martin Keown. Um, and I was a bit cocksure and thought I was probably fireproof in some respects. Um, and fell out with George, really. Um, and again, it was difficult because he, it was his first big job. He'd come from Millwall, first big job as a manager. And he had this reserve team coach who was probably not really helping him as much as he should have done. So only with hindsight, again, it, it was probably more my fault than George's. And at the start of the following season, the pre-season, George called me in and he said, look, one of us has got to go and it's not going to be me. Mm. Uh, and then we, we, we parted company. Yeah. Must have been disappointing though, because you must have Massively, felt, because yeah. it, it, again, it was my club and I yeah. you know, thought I'd be there for the rest of my life in, in many yeah. respects. Um, so it was, it was disappointing, yeah. And it, uh, but it's... But life moves on. Uh, that's right, that's football. And you went, I know you went to Wealdstone for a short time. I did, I had a short spell at Wealdstone. Um, again, probably not the best decision I've ever made. Uh, the club was in transition. They the, where they'd been a decent club, they then got rid of their youth team, their reserve team. They were in the throes of selling the ground. There was promises of money to fund this development, bring the players in to change the players around, which never happened. Um, there was inquiries about people behind the scenes. So I, I was only there for about three months and uh, I, I just looked at it and I thought, well, this is not this is not for me, this is not going anywhere, and, and um, I, I left. I, I left the club, I just couldn't really see any future there for, for me, so. Unfortunately, Bobby Gould, obviously, you were still in touch with, he yeah. offered you the chance to come to Wimbledon. Yes, well, again, through Don Howe. Um, right. I, as I'd left there, I, I, I did a little bit of scouting for Wimbledon, and I used to go down to Richardson Evans and see them occasionally, and Bobby said, look, at the end of the season, um, we've applied to go into the football combination. Um, and if we get into that, we're looking for a reserve team coach, you know, would you be interested? And, uh, yes, very much so, yeah. And that was just after Wimbledon had won the FA Cup, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it was a great time. Yeah, I, I, so I, went to the, I went to the game as, as, as a spectator, but knowing that I was, you know, the following week that I was uh, going to uh, be fortunate enough to join the club, yeah. And the first game you were involved at all, of course, was the uh, Community Shield, which yeah. was a rematch with Liverpool it with a it was. very different it was, score. It was because that was my first pre-season I'd gone in, and unfortunately Don had <coughs> been away with England and had a problem um, of some sort with illness and missed, you know, the first part of the of the season. So I was helping Bobby with the with the team, and um, that first game was was um, yeah was the was the, the Charity Shield, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which was, again, I'm thinking this is this is great. You got the team that wins the FA Cup, and the next game you go in for, and you're actually involved in the Charity Shield. And then I think I was with Bobby for the first couple of games after the start of the season, which didn't well, didn't go too well because the first one at Plough Lane was against Arsenal, 
um, which again was great. Mm. Uh, Roger Joseph, I think, I think it was Roger Joseph, I think it was, scored, which was unusual in itself. Um, and, but Arsenal went on to win 5-1, mm. with Merson scoring a couple and David Rocastle running the show. And things like that. But you were basically managing the reserves who were also playing at Plough Lane. Yeah. What's, what's your kind of memories of Plough Lane? Because it seems a long time ago, but it, it, yeah. it's such a significant time for the club there. Well, it was strange. You had, you had, you had the Richardson Evans training ground, which was at that time ramshackled. And we had a little office upstairs and the players were downstairs in really poor changing conditions. There was a cafe there which was used by the local um, lorry drivers, etc., and, and all that. So you, food, you had, to, you had to queue up in a line with Joe Bloggs who wanted to get his, his bacon roll and things like yeah. that. Um, and I'd just come from the marble halls of Highbury. And, so it was a <coughs> complete culture shock and Plough Lane with its, you know, sort of old style dressing rooms and things yeah. like that. But it, it, you couldn't help but notice it had a character. There was a it char had character, character, but it wasn't very friendly to the visiting clubs in terms of no, not facilities, was it? And that was part of the uh, success story, oh, I guess. Teams, teams hated coming there. Yeah. Because as soon as they came through the, the gates, we could just about get the coach through. And the pylons were, were, were there and you, you went through and visiting teams hated it. You know? yeah. And I, I think, you know, managers that had been there did everything possible to make sure that it, it wasn't very, very comfortable. Well, I hear all kinds of stories that the showers always ran cold water. I don't know how true that was. Yeah, and, and um, I think, remember, Bobby Gould had the... the, the the lights taken out of the toilets and Did things really? like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, there was, there was. Yeah, it was. A bit, a bit of it wasn't very nice anyway. Fish. But yeah, but they did everything possible to, you know, make put cold water on the spray. You know, with the hose, cold water on the floor before the opposition team came in. So it oh, was really still, in the dressing room. Yeah, so it was still yeah. cold on the big sort of it was like a yeah. stone floor there, and and so the water would go away, but the floor was always very cold. And uh, yeah. And where did this come from? Was this seeping down from Sam Haman's influence this or was it just I'm not sure I think I the sort of inherited it from from the original Dave Bassett days and, yeah. and that I think that's you know the, of the players there knew that if you made it difficult before you even stepped on the pitch for the opposition yeah. then then you, you, you know that you were at an advantage already yeah and these, there was rumors of loud music from the home dressing room which yeah. permeated through to the away dressing oh, the, room particularly away from home teams used yeah. to hate it you'd put your your, your um, music outside a bluster, yeah. and and that would be blaring away and again teams started to do all sorts you know they, they'd uh, they you know disconnect the plugs at the in their changing room so that you couldn't play your music and then people you know batteries and things so that there was what well, didn't need that and yeah. um, I think some of them even carried screwdrivers and fuses with them so they could sort of put it put a, put the put a, uh, electricity back on so, but, yeah. so this whole Wimbledon thing and obviously as a fan you get to hear certain things, but not really in the inside detail. It was really a policy of kind of minor harassment, wasn't there? There was, yeah. Yeah, there was. And fantastic camaraderie amongst the, the players. Yeah. <coughs> they, were, they, you know, they all knew what they were doing. They, they, they worked that way. Yeah. So give us some more examples, and I'm not necessarily asking for funny stories, but this camaraderie you're talking about, because Wimbledon was always far greater the sum of Wimbledon was always yeah. far greater than the talents of the individual players. So what, what were the factors that were important in that? Well, I think it, it was them against the, the world, really. Yeah, mm. the, the, um, and the players used to... Uh, it's not like today where they all earned fantastic amounts of money. They were still reasonably well paid, but they were still close enough and location enough where they would go out and you know, frowned upon maybe nowadays when it's changed, but they'd drink together. They, yeah. they'd, so they'd work together, they'd drink together. They, they really were mates. But the drinking, from what I understand, wasn't just to be over the top drinking, it was cementing that bond. It was cementing it, it yeah. yeah. That, that, that was, they were a group. Yeah. They, were, they were really were a team. Um, and they did all sorts, you know, from race days to going to the dogs to going to... They, they, they were together. Um, and those things are difficult to break down. You know, yeah. they, they, they would go that extra mile for each other. If, if one of their mates was 
had got beat, the next one was there putting a the tackle in. So it, it transfers itself from that to a football pitch where you really have this mentality that, that, that the opposition are out to try and get you and they're out to try and get your mates and we're not going to let it happen. Yeah. Um, and of course they could play as well. They could play, absolutely, yeah. and somehow the results were just extraordinary at times. And I always wonder, when there was a player brought in, there must have been given, presumably, thought to the player coming in, not just for his football talent and what was needed in terms of the position that you're filling, but the quality or the ability of the player to fit in with this group. Yeah, well, again, I, I think the group, whenever anybody came in, the group very quickly made it known to them that this... This was this was Wimbledon, yeah. and this if you, you did things. you did things this way, yeah, and yeah. and this was how you did it, and yeah. you know from the introduction to cutting the trouser legs off to burning shoes to all sorts of you know misdemeanors that they would they would try and do to some new player, um, and by and large most of the players saw that as as a, as a, a, a welcome rather than it's anything else. Initiation yeah. ceremony, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, so players very quickly, if they they were what they the lads used to call big time Charlies, they very quickly got knocked down to size by the yeah. players. Yeah. Was there any obvious situations where you saw big time Charlies that had to be knocked down and fitted in well with the women in spirit? Well, not really. Uh, uh, again, because it was done very quickly and they most most adapted. Yeah. Um, I can't really, I can't really think of my time there that there was somebody who, who, who left because they were, you know, they were too big for the club. Because again, they they started to buy players in, you know, Holdsworth from Brentford yeah, yeah, and people yeah, like that, yeah. who, who might well have had a, um, a different image, if you like, but they quickly adapted. They still had their image, if you like, but they quickly adapted to the Wimbledon way, mm. and what was expected of them. So, the big turning point for you was Peter Width came in for a few months as manager. He come from, did he come from Villa? I'm not sure where he came from, but certainly yeah. his. It was a strange one from Sam Herman appointing him because I think he was asking the squad to wear collar and tie, which wasn't the Wimbledon way, was it? No. Again, there there was a, a, a way about Wimbledon, the, and the Peter's idea of discipline was collar and tie, no jeans, um, which didn't really, again, uh, suit the club. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't right for the club. At that time, it wasn't right. And, um, you know, there wasn't the discipline on the pitch. You know, he couldn't, try, so, you know, so he was trying to change things off the pitch, but on the, on the pitch he wasn't doing, um, creating a, an environment which, which had, had been Wimbledon. Uh, and of course the players didn't like the changes. Um, they couldn't see the, the benefit, they couldn't see why they were having to, mm. having to do these things. Uh, and results didn't really go, go his way. He yeah, was a nice guy, really nice guy. Yeah. Uh, but I think, I think the, the final straw was when Chelsea beat us at home 2-1. I think there was, Finney was in the squad and Dennis Wise and it somehow it was just brought home that yeah. this couldn't go on. And then, and then Joe and you, I think, were called to yeah. Sam's office and asked, well, it was actually yeah. at Sam's house. I, Sam's I, can, house, yeah. I can still remember the call now, <coughs> sort of getting it early on a Sunday morning. Um, hi, baby, it's Sam. Is that how you said it, hi, baby? Hi, baby. It was always a hi, baby. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we both turned up. At, uh, Joe had been reserve team manager, but been around the first team with Peter with um, at that time, as he had been with Ray Harford, be yeah. God bless him, before yeah. that. <coughs> um, and I'd been doing the youth, and uh, got got uh, we got the call. Went there. Look, I'm going to make changes. Peter Wiv's gone. Um, I'd like you two to look after the team. Joe's the manager. I want you to work with him as his assistant. And and it was one of those. It was we got thrown into it really. Well, what was your relationship like with Joe before that? Were you quite close with him personally? <laughs> Okay-ish. I mean, uh, Joe came from North London, where I was living as well at the time, and I, so particularly the early part, he, he wasn't, he didn't have a car for some reason. So I was picking him up and going across there and having a chat and we're talking football um, and lots of other things with Joe. But 
it, it was a, no, it wasn't a particularly close relationship, certainly not from a football point of view. Yeah. Um, so I guess he was looking at me and thinking, well, you know, it, it, it wasn't, it was very much a fait accompli, you know, well, this is the way it is, that you're, you know, Terry's doing, you're coming in and, you know, so it, I don't think there was an option of him sort of it not having me or, yeah. or, or me saying, well, I don't want to work for him. It was very much when Sam said, well, this is what I want, you, you were going to do it. And uh, so we, we, we sort of had to try and make it work. It's interesting with Sam. Um, I know he's blotted his copybook, blotted his copybook major with, with women and fans, there, so women and fans now. But leaving that apart, he really had most of the time a great instinct, didn't he? Okay, mm -hmm. the Peter Wood thing was wrong, but nearly all his choices of managers, and one assumes he was involved in major signings as well, yeah. were quite Very brilliant much. at times. <clears throat> and to bring you guys together, another brilliant move. Yeah. Uh, ag again, I, I you know I know for different reasons there won't be. People watching who, who will be lovers of Sam, but he, he did. He, you know, he, he was he was very good for for, for me. Um, although we we had loads of arguments and rows and uh, things, but he was very very good. He was very good for managers at that club. Was he basically always supportive to the management team? He was, was he, was he but he was also um, he, he would ask them the right questions. You know, he he, he knew the game. Right. Not so much the football game, but he knew players, and Sam went everywhere with a, a Rothmans book. I don't know if you know Rothmans. Yeah, no, you know I the Rothmans, remember, which yeah, are, yeah, 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 not about so much nowadays. But then was the the, the Bible of information about players, and Sam carried right. that everywhere with him. Right. So he could tell you if you said about player, he knew that player played for how many games he played, how many goals he scored. So he used to question managers. You know, I I wish he'd been there when I was manager, really in many respects because I think all the managers benefited from Sam being the chairman while they while they were manager because mm. he, he was demanding of of them as managers and questioned them about different things which uh, doesn't always happen. Yeah and I was saying earlier this instinct thing he must have had this great instinct because yeah he's it, it's, it's very bright and very sharp and and uh, you know knew how to you know what what to say and what to tweak at different people to make them do the things that he wanted to do. Yeah. I remember once I was uh, a little bit after I'd left the thing of going a, away. Um, I was I was I was become this technical director and I went away to uh, to France. I drove to France. It was a sort of day off. I drove to France. Wanted to watch. Uh, it was I don't know, it was a European Champions League as then, but a European Cup game and Lens were playing. Uh, a Russian side and I wanted to watch the Russian strikers because they were excellent and I was at the game and Sam phoned me up and said hey baby where are you so I said oh, I'm in France I'm watching the what are you doing there why have you gone there we're not going to sign any players from from that game what are you I'm saying Sam I've gone there to watch the best strikers in the world if I'm going to work with the the academy players which I think I might just have been coming back to do I, I want to watch what the best players in the world are doing and yeah. that no that's not for us baby we, you should be at Brentford <laughs> you should be, you should be at Leighton Orient watching players. You know, so I've travelled thousands of miles to to get somewhere to watch what I thought was, a, and Sam had sort of burst my balloon. But you, I want to see you in the morning at the training ground. So I went in the next day, and I, you know, we had a, a little bit of a heated discussion. But as with Sam, once he'd said his his piece to you, and and you said yours, it was forgotten. So why did you move from being the assistant manager to the youth academy? The, yeah, the, well, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd had 20 years and we'd had a great season. I think we finished sixth in the league. We had two semi finals. And uh, I just had this vision. I thought there was something else out there. There was something I needed to uh, invigorate my own enthusiasm and coaching. So I, I wanted to go around Europe and see what was going on and, and then bring things back. and. So my idea of it was that I would go off, come back, and come back, and then do some work and show people what was going on, so that you, you know something was fresh. But Sam wanted me to do the scouting while I was away, so I had to, to get what I wanted to do. I had to buy into Sam's vision of, of the scouting part as well, which I can see from his point of view. That that is, so that was a really a constant battle because I'd be going places to think, well, I'll go on a technical visit here and watch that, and Sam would say, no, you need to go off and. Mm. 
Um, so it, it was, it was, that was my decision then to do that. Um, at the end of that, uh, that season as well, Glenn Hoddle had wanted me to join up with the England team. Um, was one of the coaches. Right. And the club put the block on it. Um, How did that affect you? I was disappointed, obviously, yeah. because you don't get a chance very often yeah. to go and do those things. And uh, um, I was disappointed. And Sam said, you see, it's, you're doing this new role. You wouldn't have been able to do that and that. So he, he used it as a reason to sort of say, well, that's the reason why we couldn't do it. But yeah. Sam thought it would water down my involvement with the team. And uh, so, yeah, so that was disappointing. So I thought, well, I'm with, I'll, I'll, I've got to get something here that I want to do that I feel is... is uh, going to stimulate me as a coach and a football person to keep me going and, and so you had that ambition to move forward in your knowledge and yes yeah, yeah. because yeah. you can at a football club if you if you're doing the same thing day in day out and you, you don't get the opportunity to go out and research and to find out what's going on at, elsewhere around the world you you stand still and I, I didn't really want that you know and so I had this period of going out which again I had some great trips uh, you know the one to Barcelona I remember a day at Barcelona um, Bobby Robson had been technical director and he'd invite, invited me over and I was sat on the, on, in the dugout of the new Camp um, with Bobby Robson watching their first team train and Van Gaal was the manager and uh, they were training and as they came over Bobby said to this guy who I didn't know, hey Jose, Jose, what's, what's it was Mourinho oh, right. who'd been one of Bobby's sort of um, people there that had helped Bobby, Bobby yeah. Robson. So. Yeah. You know, situations like that wouldn't have got. I then watched all the kids training at Barcelona from a very young age through to their, their youth team. I went off to Clairefontaine, I went to Bayer Leverkusen, I went to Ajax. So I, I, I you know, had some, some good technical visits. Yes. Um, and, and, do you, and do you feel that filtered through, that knowledge filtered through to the first team at all? Not the first team, because no. it, again, I mean, Joe, you know, wasn't really a coach coaching sort of person really mm. uh, my idea was that that's what I would do I'd come back and you know put it on but but by that time uh, first Sanch had come in and David Kemp and then um, Mickey Harford and so my role was completely different then you know mm. I'd, I'd gone off I was out of the out of that setup and other people were in uh, but it didn't really worry me because I wanted to do what I wanted to do and I yeah. knew it would keep me going, it would stimulate me for, for years to come, which it, which it did. It was a, I think it was one of the best things I've ever done. Oh. So then there was all the kind of shenanigans about changing where we played and Dublin came out for time, didn't it? Yeah, Dub yeah Dublin was, was, what was... What was your reaction when you... To heard? Dublin? Yeah. Well, it was a bit like a fairy tale, wasn't it? You Joe know, you, was in favour of that, or seemed to be. Yeah, but we... We're sort of football people. We'd, we'd, <laughs> it was like we're going to Dublin. You know, you'd, you'd do what you're told. Really, you'd, you'd go because you would do it. You'd do what you're told, and it was a bit like a fantasy as well. None of us really thought it you would, it would come off. No, no, I don't think we ever thought. Oh yeah, we're going to go to Dublin. But yeah. it obviously was something that was really high in Sam's, I you know thoughts and other people. Yeah. So was Sam's motivation? Obviously, you got to know him reasonably well. Uh, did you feel that he genuinely wanted to take the club up to the, a bigger league? I think he did. You know, yeah. everything you look at what he did, he saw Wimbledon being in the top flight and challenging for the, the, the top honours. You know, mm. he, 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 uh, he did, but I think the only way he saw that he could do that would be to, to, to make it a bigger club and to get this bigger fan base, and that was his idea behind mm. it that that was the place to go because they didn't have a football club and you know so I'm guessing that that that's where he wanted to go with it you know but it never really sort of sat down and discussed it with us at any any great length you know. mm. and then of course the, the Norwegians came in 98 I think it was yeah he, I think again it's part it. of Sam's plan to you know to get um, investors in to he try sold 90 percent of the club I think it was yeah. to the Norwegians yeah. and did that initially change very much as far as you could see well again I, I was I was a at that stage, I'd done my technical director. I'd, I'd had too much of travelling, and I came back as academy director. Yeah. Uh, as the formation of the academy, so I was in the background. Really, I didn't really sort of know too much about what, you know, what these people were like or what was going on. And uh, as far as I could see, Sam was still running the show. Right. 
Yeah. And then Joe had his heart attack at Sheffield Wednesday. Yes, yeah, yeah. I remember being at home and it coming up on, on the news or Sky News or whatever it was then, and, and uh, I got on the phone to his wife, Bonnie, and to try and find yeah. out how he was. And, and then the next thing we knew, there was a Norwegian manager, yeah. Egil Olsen, who seemed to be a communist <laughs> and had a very strange way of playing football. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm in the background watching what's going on, yeah. really. There was Egil. He had an assistant who he bought in Norway called Lars. Um, Mickey Harford was still involved with them. Yeah. I think Sench might have gone by then, I'm not sure. But So he, he, there, there was a sort of management team. Um, I think Sanch did the reserves. Sanch was doing the reserves, and then I was still this academy director. Um, so I was I was a little bit distant from it. Uh, again, it, it, it was the it was the theme at the time, wasn't it, for to get uh, foreign managers in. You know, it, it it was just becoming the the novelty that you get managers. But Wimbledon had not before. Gone no. with the themes and also done the, always done their own thing. Yeah, that and you could, yeah, and really and truly, you thought, well, the Norwegians <coughs> have had an influence in this, you know. I can only yeah. assume. That, uh, um, and the only thing I can re really, the first thing I remember about that that one day was it was the pre-season, and uh, at the end of the previous season, we'd said to uh, the people behind the scenes that we were, look, we need to do something about the pitches. They need money spent on them. You need an irrigation system. We, if we're going to take the club forward, this needs to be done at, at Richardson Evans. We, it needs money spent on it. Anyway, we came back pre-season. The pitches were rubbish. Mm. And I remember Sam, I'd, I was, I'd, I'd, I'd just had a, I'd had a staff meeting with my coaching staff at the time, Ernie Tippett and Stuart Robson, and we'd gone off to have a, a spot of lunch. And I got a phone call from that, Sam going ballistic. Back here, this da, 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 da. the training ground was was awful. Yeah. So for some reason, and when I got back, I said, "Well, what do you want me to do about it?" But you know about these things. You should have made sure it was okay. I said, "Look, at the end of the season, I told, you know, the powers to be, we need the money spent on this." But that was Sam. He'd had Egel out on the pitch. Egel had gone out on the training pitch, gone back, and obviously saw how, how bad yeah. it was, and, and probably complained to Sam, and then he he went ballistic. So, but it was different. It was it was different. I mean, Egg obviously was a was a had his own characteristics, um, which weren't the Wimbledon way and didn't work anyway. Seems. No, I mean that again. That was I, I thought early pre-season they showed some signs of some promise, but then then it just drifted away and it was a it was a you know really nightmare sort of season for them. Anyway, three games from the end of the season, yeah. Wimbledon were down there near the bottom. The, Grave danger of going down, and you got a call to, was it in effect make you a, a joint manager with Egan Olsen for the last well, three games? Not really. I mean, it got so a tell call what really to, happened. Yeah, got, I got a call to would I uh, play in Bradford away? So it was from Sam the call or David Barnard who gave you made the call? It was Sam. 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 Um, what did I he say know, to you? No, it was I don't know Sam then at that stage. Was it Sam or, or might have been? I got a call. I got the call. Would I come back in and help the, the team? So again, Egger was still there, Lars was yeah. still there, Mickey was still yeah. there. I got up, we travelled up to um, Bradford. Yeah, we travelled up and we trained at, at, uh, in Manchester. So we had a training session, which I said to him, Do you want me to take? So I took the training session, and the next day they had their team plan. Um, and we, we played Bradford and. Uh, that game was uh, obviously was the was the turning point really where they they lost three nil. decided to that had enough. Yeah, a close game and you know really until they give a bad penalty was given against Ben Thatcher. Um, John Hartson got sent off. Yeah. So you know there was a sort of fight in the dressing room at the end at Bradford, which was probably one twentieth of the the space that you'd have in this room. So it was a real can you tell me who was fighting who? Do you remember? I think it was Dean Blackwell and John Hartson mm. had had a, some word because of him getting sent off and this, that, and the other. Yeah. So, yeah. and uh, yeah, it showed that they had, a, you know, still had some passion. But because uh, up prior to that, the, the, I think that was the tenth or some game on the trot that got yeah. beat. So it was interesting. I was asking, I was talking to Marcus Gale last week to obviously get questions mm. for you, and he said he felt at that point in the team. 
there was three type groups of players. There's the ones that didn't give a shit, to be honest. The ones that were professional, okay, they played properly, yeah. but didn't really have the passion of Wimbledon. And there was a third who really had, still had the women's spirit and wanted them to stay up. And I just find yeah. it extraordinary that people can play a game like football, getting, even though it wasn't massive wages, then it was still decent yeah, wages. Yeah, decent money. Yeah. And not have a passion for the game, it's just unbelievable. Yeah, again, I'd, I'd been in the background, so I hadn't seen all the, many of the games. I'd seen a yeah. few home games, and, and uh, but I hadn't seen many of the games. But you know, when you lose 10 games on the trot, you, you know something's not right. Yeah. And I think that, you know, once that went from that Wimbledon group, um, yeah, lost a big part of their effectiveness when they lost their passion. Um, anyway, the next game was the famous yeah. game at Villa. Yeah, again, what you know, it's one so of not, those. Not listen, I don't, Sorry, think, I don't think this has ever happened since or will ever happen again, where two games to go, the manager gets the sack. I can't, rem I can't ever remember it happening anywhere. Um, but what, what, what do I do? I, you know, it was, it was the travelling back from Bradford, they'd sacked Eggle. I was on the coach when I got back. I was, the phone was ringing. You know, wanted to meet you when you get off. Went with Dave Barnard to some place in Chelsea somewhere. I think it was one of their apartments. And uh, will you take the job? So, what do you do? You know, there's only one real answer. You've got to say, well, it wasn't even take the job. Will you take the team? <laughs> you know, yeah. so there wasn't the job wasn't sort of there and then offered, but um, in. You, you go, of course, I've got you. What, what do you do? Walk away from it and say, no, you're not going to try and help. And uh, did, did you think you could keep us up? Yeah. 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 yeah I thought we've, we've got two games to go. Yeah. You know, we, we need to, to match what Bradford are, are, are doing, really. So, um, of course, there was a, you know, you, you, you don't really have a, an option. You've, you, you take it with hindsight now. You know, when you get that opportunity, you go, oh, was I, was I the fodder for the Norwegians to take the the the, the, the can for going down? Um, but I don't think anyone in their right mind would have looked at it and go, oh, you know. I mean, some people get half a season now and say, well, I've not had long enough to turn it around. Yeah. You know, I I had two games in in <laughs> in, in sort of about you know, fifteen days to sort of turn it around. So, at the end of that game, when Hearts and equalised almost on time, I think it was extra time. Yeah, you must have thought. Kind of, you've done it. Yeah, yeah. I can still remember walking down the side of the pitch at Sellers, and, and a guy right in the corner there said, again, everyone's going mad and all that, and guy there saying, resign now, <laughs> <laughs> which was probably great advice, really. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, uh, I, I should, I'd like to get hold of that guy and sort of see what his future advice is, because that, <laughs> that was pretty sound. Um, yeah. um, and then the build-up to the Southampton, which was crazy, really. Did you think we could win at Southampton, or at least we'd have to have won because, of course, Bradford won. Yeah, It'd but we, Liverpool. we didn't know that. Yeah. Um, we had to match their result. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's difficult because people have said since then, oh, ha, you know, this is, this is a massive game, a really probably biggest game in 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 the club's history in in many respects. Um, and you just come on the back of ten defeats, and uh, the players are the same group of players. And, yeah. and, and uh, uh, how do you go into them? The preparation for that game, and I've I've, I've reflected on it many times. Of, of again, with hindsight, of, of do you take the pressure off them? Do you? Know, but the you know the thing you're saying to them that this is a massive game. You know they underperformed for the last six months. You've now got to turn it around. You know, you can't go doing what you've been doing for the last six months. This is a this is a massive game. You need to you need to perform, and these are the things you need to do, and these are the processes we'll go about. And we so we worked at, at those things. But I think the players had to know how big that game was. Mm. You know, <laughs> and and again, we now know that it it it, it, it was a massive massive game. Um, so ha you, you can't sort of hide it, can you? You can't sort of say, well, don't worry about. You know, it's uh, it's only another game. It wasn't another game. This was the biggest game that they were arguably, you know, going to play in, or certainly playing for Wimbledon. Mm -hmm. um, and it, obviously, it didn't go our way. It didn't go the way that we'd we'd all hoped. You're quoted as saying, I read somewhere, you're quoted as, 
relegation was the most difficult day of your life? It certainly was, was uh, football-wise, yeah. yeah, yeah, because you, yeah, I've just been, I've, you know, two weeks, I was, I was actually planning to go to a visit to watch the uh, tournament in Israel that weekend for my job as academy director. Yeah. And, you know, there's no football training that prepares you for, I remember an interview having Egil got sat and be made manager, uh, you know, and he needed Kate Adie there, and I thought that there'd been actually a war, you know, on Wimbledon Common um, mm. because there were so many lights, cameras, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How does it be, you prepare you for those situations? So it, it, it was a very difficult, difficult mm. time because obviously it's not just your own disappointment; it's uh, it's all the supporters as well. So we went down. Bradford beat Liverpool. Ironically, we played Bradford a few weeks ago in the. Uh, yeah. League two and beat them two yeah. one and it's yeah. incredible to think that we had to mm. collapse as a club, well, not exist as a club, start again, come up five promotions and they'd slid down the leagues during that time. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, obviously then it was what what was then Division One now called the Championship, and then uh, fairly early on this whole era Milton Keynes started to. Uh, yeah, had, had, again had, had, the Norwegians had. had um, Sort of, I remember going to with Dave Barnard going to um, going to Norway and their apartment in Norway and uh, them discussing their vision for the club, mm. you know, which was about a culture change. Can we make Wimbledon, you know, which was perceived to be this ragged Arsh Rovers type team, da -da 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 -da, but had been very successful. But could we could we make them the culture change? Could we make them more professional? Could we change the image of it? They were going to get feed a um, uh, like an amalgam not an amalgamation of joining the clubs, but um, like partnership with Ajax, where maybe we could loan their players and they could go out. So they had this vision of the club, but the vision at that stage wasn't it wasn't mentioned. They was looking at new stadium. But then there wasn't this, there was a new, looking at a new stadium, you know, and, and uh, yeah. they didn't sort of say what it's going to going to be in Kingstonians or, or or somewhere around the M25. It was just we want this new stadium where we can yeah. get you know. So they had a, the the vision for it, but of course there was a uh, they needed to sell players and they needed to reduce the wage bill and, and so it was a tough start for a, a, yeah. a novice manager going into those that that situation. Yeah. Uh, when did you actually hear first about the Milton Keynes possibility? Do you remember? Yeah, sometime I suppose during that, I can't remember if it was during that pre-season or, or season, that the guy, uh, Winkleman, uh, yeah. had, was, had been around a few, at Sellers a little bit, and then there was a meeting I had to go to in, uh, in London where this I whole idea now was, was sort of Bought out around this table that that the club would um, would would go to Milton Keynes. Mm. What was your response to start with? It was a bit like the 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 Dublin thing, only yeah. less romantic. <laughs> uh, that's probably true, actually. Um, yeah. You know that that oh yeah 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 okay well we've heard it all before. Yeah. You so know you didn't probably didn't quite believe it was. It doesn't happen. happen in football, does it? No. People don't take their, their team away from their, their, from football, where they no. <laughs> where they're supposed to be and move them uh, miles away. So it was a, it was like a yeah yeah okay well it's it's another journey that someone's trying to do and look at which won't won't ever happen. And how did you find Charles Koppel? I found him by accident really. I got sort of put in with him. It, it, it was uh, <laughs> um, how did I find him? Uh, he was he was sort of. Like a, it reminded me of a salesman, really, of a salesman who was, was trying to sell something, very sort of enthusiastic, um, had a product but really didn't know the product, but had good enthusiasm about this product, you know, he, 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 but he didn't really know the ins and outs of the product and he didn't know the ins and outs of a football club and what made a football club tick. Um, and like a salesman, he could tell you something which, when you actually read the print, didn't turn out to be true. Huh. So, um, again, I'm a, I'm a new manager, I'm, I'm just in the job. I suppose they were, were reasonably um, supportive in terms of, of, of players, but we were, you know, players were going out, you know, you're 
your Thatchers were going out and getting sold, and your coal courts yeah. were being sold, and your yules were being, you know, it was there was players going out for a lot of money, and uh, so there was money coming back in, and we were trying to invest part of that. But, uh, it was a little bit of the, the blind leading the blind in, in some respects. You were doing the best you can in probably quite a difficult situation. It, it was it was difficult, and um, you know I, I, I enjoyed it. It was a, it was a it was a great time. I, I loved the whole thing really. Um, and you know, even though there were battles to be fought, and I didn't quite know about this guy here and that guy there, it was something that I wanted to do. So. Um, you know, I, I gave it. I gave it everything I had. When the protest started, like the Black Bloom protest, I think it was the Birmingham game. How, how did that affect you and the players? Uh, you always hope that when you get out on the pitch, you know, you, you can perform, and it doesn't matter what's going off of it. But there was the whole thing of it, wasn't it? It was the the whole atmosphere there was 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 wrong, in terms of how you would expect an atmosphere to be. Again, as it. I don't think I've ever experienced it or seen it. I certainly never experienced it or seen it anywhere to that extent, you know. And, and we could understand, we could understand the fans' frustration. The players could understand. We could understand it, but it it didn't help, obviously, our calls. Um, even though we knew it wasn't directed at, at, at the team or myself. Uh, did, did you think any of the players underperformed because of it? I think if you look at the. The, our away form was fantastic, wasn't it? I mean, the, it was. When we beat, it was good. We beat Man yeah. City, and yeah. the, you know, we, yeah. we were we were exceptional away from home. Yeah. So I'm guessing that that, in s at some level, it probably did filter down and, and, and might have had some effect. But uh, you never know. It's difficult to. You can only look at the, st the the stats, can't you? And go that home form was like mid table. The away form was 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 promotion. Yeah. And was Koppel supportive of you until the end? You feel? Again, he, he, he was at this, you know, what what he would talk about there. I, I, when he went out of that door, I wouldn't put my hand on my heart and say he was supportive of, of, yeah. of but I didn't really care. You know, I was going to do my job. I was going to do it how I wanted to do it as much as I could. Yeah. And I was, you know, I was very much hands on. I was out on the training ground. I was, I was doing those things. So. Um, you know, from my point of view, I was getting out of it as much as I could get out of it. But again, I know all this stuff was going on and, and uh, around it, but I couldn't, I couldn't influence it or affect it. Um, there was, a, there was a situation we talked about this on the phone with Peter Hawkins, mm. where you were told not to play him by Koppel. Yeah, this was the, the, this was the the week leading up to the 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 uh, last game of that. Of that season at Sellers, yeah. um, and again, I think we'd. If you remember I, th that year, I I gone into this was where the really the the, the problem started. I I uh, we played away at Portsmouth, and I was really unwell. I'd been unwell for about two weeks, and uh, I didn't travel with the team to Portsmouth. But I drove down at night. I took the team. We won two one, and the next day I had to, I went into hospital with a burst appendix. Okay, and I was in hospital. Um, and it was very serious. I've seen the doctor who's a lovely, a lovely man, still goes down to AFC Wimbledon oh, actually. Great. And, and uh, okay. he uh, really saved my life because it, it was that, it was that, that close. bad, it was close. Yeah. And um, um, so I was very ill um, and I'd been told under no circumstances would anybody go, etc., etc. And Kevin Cooper went while I was lying in my, in, in, in bed in the hospital. Yeah. Um, and at this stage we still had a chance of, of playoffs. Yeah, you know, um, and there was you know sort of things going on like that. Well, while I was out of the way, there was there was players sort of going out the door, and uh, we came back. I think whatever the game was, we we just couldn't quite make the playoff. So there was two games to go. Uh, I think we drew away at Fulham nil nil. I think, and then then this last game, but we we were outside of the we couldn't the, the points difference were too big to actually get into the playoffs, and so there's nothing at stake on the game, and. Um, I got, a, I got. A, he came down to the training ground and said, "Look, you know, we've had a look at it. If you play this player, Peter Hawkins, we've got to give him X amount of pounds on his for a new contract because he's played so many games." Yeah. So, so I went, yeah. What's wrong with that? You know, it's, it's that's what happens in football. Like, you know, yeah. well, there's nothing on stake at the game. Why do you have to play him? So I said, because he's earned the right to. Yeah. You know, he's a, he's a, 
he wasn't like a one of the top earners. It wasn't as if he was going to get like masses of money. He's probably talking about on his contract the reward for doing well and playing so many games. This is a young lad that's come through your youth system. That is everything. But you know whatever you've said to young players the, the about if you work hard, if you do well, if you get in the first team, you'll get the rewards. This we can't rewards, give you a lot yeah, of money now, yeah, but yeah. but look, if you do it and you get in the team, we'll yeah. give you as much reward as you can. Yeah. And so I said no. I said he plays. So then got a phone call. Uh, look, the, you know the owners are, are, are not very pleased about this. You you can't play him. I said yeah, I'm, I'm playing him. I said this is. This is this is you know not about this is a, a, a matter of principle, not just my principle. It should be the club's principle. It should be what the club's about. It should be a, you know if you're talking about what belief the club has. You're, you're, we want to play young players, and we want players to come in the first thing. We've got to look after him. I said, do you not think that every other player in that dressing room will know the reason why he hasn't played mm. and what they will then think about the club? Mm. I said, so I'm not doing it for Terry Burton. I'm doing it about the club. I'm trying to protect the club. Yeah. Well, they don't, they're not going to be very happy. I said, well, they'll have to not be very happy. I'm playing him. And I played him. So, mm. um, But I would do it again. Because it's, it's, it's it, again, it's, it should be about what the club's built on. This principle of, 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 you know, we gave 13 players their debuts in the two years that yeah. I was there. And, and we were trying to change the club around to where the, the young players came in and played. And they, they had that feeling again for the club. And... and um, but yeah, so. Someone else asked me to ask you about the David Nielsen loan agreement when he went to Norwich. Yeah, well, that was another case of, of, of really not, not knowing from their point of view what football was about. David Nielsen wasn't in the first team group at the time, so we were going to loan him out to Norwich. I said to him that, yeah, OK, let him go there, play some games and get the match experience. But don't let him play against us because we play them in two weeks' time. Because so he said, well, why not? So I said, well, that's you, you just don't do that. It's an unwritten law rule that you, because players always, when they come back to play against, you always end up scoring or, or playing well. And, and the, oh, don't be so stupid. Like you know, we'll know him. We should know him even better than if he's one of our players. We should be. So in Coppel's eyes, it was an advantage the fact he used to play for. Uh, yeah, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was that sort of football yeah. nous that he, he had that. Uh, uh, that he thought it would be a good idea, um, rather than a bad idea. So. And he scored, didn't he? He did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, he scored the goal. So there was those, lots of those little things that were towards the end of that season, which, uh, yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, which were, weren't right. You know. Then you got the sack. Yeah. Well, uh, listen. When I left that ground on on that day, I knew that the, yeah. I'd I'd gone against them on on yeah on the Peter Hawkins Hawkins, thing, they'd sold players behind my back, they'd they'd done things that, and I, you know, at the time I I, I wasn't, uh, uh, I was trying to let the press know as much as I possibly could without overstepping a mark that, you know, this wasn't right. Yeah. Anyway. In fact, when I was in hospital, I had a plan that I would try and oust Charles Koppel. Really? Yeah in hospital and I wasn't delirious at the time. Huh. I'd had a plan. The only way that this club could go forward was if I could get rid of of Charles Coppel and his henchman. I forget what his name was. But the the big thing about that was the fact that this Milton Keynes thing got kicked out. If that had got kicked out, my plan yeah. was I said, look, th- our only hope is that we get the supporters on side, yeah. that we come together as a club. And we, 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 you know, with the backing of the supporters, we, we go again. I said, but we can't do it with Koppel. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that was my plan. But of course, that, that got killed when they... Uh, um. So, you got the sack. We lost the club, in effect, because it yeah. did get moved to Milton Keynes. Yeah. Um, how did you feel when it officially went through the FA, the Milton Keynes? Again, thing? it's unbelievable, really. Yeah. You can't imagine how anybody in their right mind can be at the FA, who are the guardians of our game, who could be sitting there and making a decision uh, that would take a football club hundreds of miles away from its natural mm. home. You know, has it ever happened before? Has it ever happened since? You know, it just doesn't just doesn't happen. You 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 can't believe that they could actually, you know, these these men of power could come to this decision. It was just crazy. 
anyway, the great thing was it about, and I'm always so proud of as a supporter, women and fans, okay, we did have yeah. protests and moans, but we did something positive. Oh, exactly, yeah. And then there were obviously key three or four people who got the beginning of the club together. Yeah. A lot of supporters got behind them. And there was the famous trials on women in common, which you went along to, which was brilliant. I, I did, yeah. Dave Barnard, again, who, who had also been sacked during that season, um, had, uh, had said to me, look, they've got the, the trials on it. Do you fancy yeah. going down there? So yeah. I went, yeah, great. Come on, let's go. We'll go yeah. and give our, give our support. Um, because, again, I'd had a, after this, I'd had a few press people then came on and said, well, what do you think about you know, women? And so I said, look, you know, they've been shafted. They've, they, they've been, a, but like what you said, they've, they're not just accepting it. They, they're actually trying to do something about it. I think it's fantastic that this group of people are now trying to recreate a football club. You know, what, what's wrong with that? You know, at this stage, I'm still under contract to Wimbledon, but I've been sacked, but I'm still under contract. OK. Yeah. And, and up to that stage, still getting paid. Did you actually give any advice on which players should be given a, a uh, shot? Not, Do you remember? Not, no, I didn't, because yeah. again, this was a group of you know, <laughs> Sunday league players, really, probably at best. That I, yeah. I'm guessing, with all due respects to the ones that were there, and uh, you know, uh, Terry wasn't it? Who, 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 Terry Eames, no? Terry, Terry Eames, Terry Eames who had done a, a manager, yeah. magnificent job at getting this group of people together, and then eventually, <laughs> you know, getting them, getting them yeah. playing as a team, um, which was was uh, was fantastic. But again, there my support was for what they'd done. Yeah, you know, yeah. The, the principle again of it, of, of uh, we've been shafted, but okay, fair enough, you, you, can sh you can kick us, but you can't keep us down. Yeah. And uh, yeah, great, terrific, you know, you've taken it away from them. You're surely not going uh, you know, to, you surely you're not going to begrudge them having this chance to start again. But apparently they did. Well, it's been an incredible nine years in terms of what Wimbledon's done and five yeah. promotions in nine years. And I'm always so proud of, like people said, not only was it not in the wide range of football, but football fans could never run a club. And so far it's been proved not true because not only football fans have won a club, they've actually done pretty well during that time. And, Amazing. Uh, I've had at least three questions saying, would you like to be AFC Wimbledon manager one day? Now, we've got a great manager at the moment, of course. so it's not present. Yeah, and, and again, would it appeal you know, to you one day, you've, do you think? Uh, you've, you've no wish for, for Terry, but when Terry becomes mayor <laughs> and uh, is given the freedom of, 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 uh, of the city. No, it, it, listen, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a football man. I have great uh, affinity with the club and, um, you know, whatever capacity sometime down the, the line that, that there was an opportunity and, and situation in who knows in whatever capacity you never know you know you say yeah. manager it, it might be chairman you never know or, <laughs> or um, uh, uh, you, you know you just you just don't know but but uh, obviously I've, I've you know they've they've Wimbledon has, has always been good to me and um, mm -hmm. it, hopefully I'll always uh, you know there'll always be a part of me that will be close to it. Thank you. I, th I think I think the connection will always be there as well. I know you've been to several matches. You did the fundraising dinner last yeah. year, which was great, and uh, and, I, and so many supporters appreciate the old players and managers giving us support from time to time because it was lonely at times. And now I can imagine somehow yeah. being in the football league, it's oh, it's just yeah, incredible. For you guys that, have, that were there at the start, it must give you great satisfaction to think, well, you know. We've seen it grow. It's, it's happened in our time, which again, probably not many people thought when you started it that you would all still be around when it was when it was actually back in the football yeah. league. So it's, although it's like all things in time, it, it, it seems a, a, the journey. I, I'm I'm guessing it's so much quicker than you all envisaged, really. I think it's as we hoped it would happen, but I think for a lot of people, including me, I thought it might take a couple of years longer. Yeah. Yeah. And it was ironical because it took us nine years from where we got promoted to the old Division 4 to get into the top league at the time, the first division. And again, it took AFC Wimbledon yeah. nine years from it starting to get back yeah. into football. And this nine years nine thing. Nine year thing, yeah. yeah. Well, let's hope in another nine years that you're uh, well, back Well, let's see. In that football will line. change a lot in that time. And that's all the it, it has, and the, and the yeah. gap between the, those the haves and have nots yeah. has, has, has got yeah. wider, yeah. Anyway, Terry, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak been to Asia Women on TV. Good luck, because I know now you've been, I think you're officially on gardening leave from Cardiff, so there's a new world opening for you somewhere. 
And you've been through this before, haven't you, in kind of having to wait and see what happens? Yeah, not, not for as long before, so um, patience so. is running out a little bit now, but okay. um, um, the well, garden's finished and looking good, so uh, I need to be moving on. Somebody emailed in these on his garden, leave his lawn must be pristine, maybe he should start an allotment. So. Yeah, well, I'd, yeah, that's, that's right. If, this, if I don't get a job in the next few months, I should probably be looking around for one. Yeah. Okay, all right, thanks again. Brilliant, thank thanks you. Thanks for all you did for Wimbledon, and, and good luck. And good luck to you as well. Thank you. thank you. And thanks everybody for watching another interview with uh, legends from uh, AFC Wimbledon, this time Terry Burton. Goodbye.